Great. Can you all hear me? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Srinivas, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to speak in front of you all today. Uh, we spend a lot of our time speaking with other physicians about how to advance the field, but I think I, I speak on behalf of all our colleagues when I say that we get the most satisfaction from being with you, the patients. Uh, so it is quite an honor to be here with you all today. Um, I also wanted to thank Dr. Diedrich for that great setup for this portion of the talk as well. Uh, as Dr. Diedrich was saying, we have made considerable advancements in the field of not only kidney cancer, but also cancer in general over the last several decades. And I actually first wanted to start off with the book recommendation because I feel that no one actually better chronicles this journey that we've been on over the last several decades better than Siddhartha Mukherjee in his book, The Emperor of All Maladies. Many of you may have actually read this book before, uh, but it's a Pulitzer Prize winning book, uh, which is subtitled A Biography on Cancer. And Mukherjee talks about the evolution that has taken place over the last several decades. And for those of you who are, uh, may, may not have the attention span to read a 300 page book, there's actually a PBS series on it, so you can just watch it on TV as, as I did. Um, and uh, so Mukherjee actually talks about the four pillars of cancer treatment. So I was going to go into those in a little bit more detail. Uh, so just to give you a historical perspective of where the field has evolved. So we know back in the day in the 1800s, we actually first started off with surgery being the first pillar of cancer therapy. Uh, so if you ask a surgeon how to take care of a cancer, he or she will say, well, let's just cut it out. And that actually is very effective in early stage treatments. However, we know that the role of surgery is somewhat limited in advanced cancer. So then in the early 1900s, we actually saw the evolution of what we call uh, radiation therapy. Radiation therapy was, uh, was invented shortly after we discovered x-rays. And the thought was that x-rays actually caused breaks in the strands of DNA of of rapidly replicating cancer cells. So the thought is if we could prevent that from happening, we would prevent cancer cells from replicating. And in the 1900s, it was thought that radiation therapy would be the cure for all cancer treatment. And while that's not quite the case, we do know that it is still very effective. Uh, the effectiveness in kidney cancer is still yet to be seen, however. In the uh, 1940s then, we actually saw the introduction of what we call chemotherapy, as you all know today. So something that you may not have known is that chemotherapy actually derived uh, initially from nitrogen mustard gas. Uh, that was, it, was a, uh, it was a tool that was used in World War II as, a, as poisonous gas. And when soldiers came back from the war, physicians and scientists actually noticed that their white blood cell counts and the red blood cell counts were severely depressed. So they actually had what we call bone marrow suppression. So a few scientists got together and thought, hey, maybe this is a good idea of a way to treat actually blood cancers. So now it was actually being used in the 1940s as a treatment for leukemia and lymph uh, lymphoma. And then in the last decade, we saw this explosion of what we call targeted therapy, as Dr. Diedrich was just talking about. So targeted therapies are, is, is basically a evolution of where we come because our improved understanding of the molecular underpinnings of, of kidney cancer. So we know, as Dr. Diedrich said, that the protein VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, plays a very important role in kidney cancer. So targeting this pathway and blocking its uh, ability to exist in, in tumor cells limits the ability of this kidney cancer to grow and divide. Similarly, the mTOR pathway, which is another very important protein uh, and pathway that is involved in the survival of kidney cancer, we know that by blocking this pathway, we have drugs, as Dr. Diedrich had talked about, temsorolimus and everolimus, that are very effective in kidney cancer. Uh, so in the last 10 years, we've seen this explosion of drugs uh, uh, in, in kidney cancer. So we as oncologists are very optimistic about where the field is going. And now all these drugs are now FDA approved, which is very exciting. So in the last uh, four or five years, however, there's been a lot of buzz in the oncology world. And there's been a fifth pillar that's been added to the cancer treatment paradigm. And you probably guessed that's immunotherapy, as you're probably all well aware. In fact, the director of clinical immunology at Johns Hopkins was quoted as saying, I have such confidence in the potential of immunotherapy that I think the years from 2010 to 2015 will be looked at historically as the time that immunotherapy became the fifth pillar of cancer treatment. So certainly a very exciting time in the field, and I think a lot of people will see this as potentially the golden age of oncology. So how do we define immuno immunotherapy? So I actually, I, I define immunotherapy as harnessing the power of the immune system to fight cancer. 
And a lot of people will think that this is something that has just began in the last two or three years. But the origins of uh, immunotherapy were actually much, uh, much far, go much farther back than what you may have imagined. It actually dates back to this year, in 1891, with this gentleman, Dr. William Coley. So Dr. Coley was a specialist on oncology who specialized in this type of cancer, which is soft tissue sarcoma. And so Dr. Coley actually kept meticulous records of all his patients that he was seeing with sarcoma. And what he noted one day was an outstanding revelation. He actually noticed that patients with sarcoma who were infected with this bacteria, Streptococcus pyogenes, which manifested as a facial rash or erysipelas, actually lived longer than patients who did not have the infection, which was, very, was, which was a very interesting observation at the time. So, Dr. Coley did what any uh, a logical person in, in the 1800s would do, and he started injecting people with Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, and what he, and he actually called this Coley's toxins. Uh, and the thought at that time was that maybe these toxins are actually killing the cancer. And lo and behold, he actually saw several responses. So he started injecting patients with bacterial strains, and he started seeing tumors regress or get smaller, which is very interesting. Uh, the, the bad side is that people started dying of Streptococcus pyogenes infection. So it wasn't the most effective treatment. But this is kind of the story of how immunotherapy was born. So since that time, now we have a lot more uh, mature data that shows that there is a relationship between the immune system and cancer. And some of the most compelling data comes from patients who have undergone kidney transplant. So when you undergo a kidney transplant, you, turks, you take certain medications that we call, uh, that immunosuppress the body. So they're immunosuppression drugs that keep the immune system at bay so you don't reject your transplanted organ. And so when, and these patients who have a weak immune system, we know that they are, they have a high susceptibility to developing cancer. So you can see here that the patients with a weak immune system have a 20-fold increase of developing skin cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemias, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and a smattering of other oncologic uh, uh, problems. Um, so the thought is that if you have a weak immune system, you're more susceptible to getting cancer. So then the thought was that the corollary should also be true. If you have a strong immune system, you should be able to either prevent cancer or eliminate it. So uh, more science uh, came on over the next several years, and one of our first drugs in this modern day of immunotherapy was actually not so modern. It was in the 1970s, and we had a drug called IL-2. Uh, so IL-2 works by stimulating T cells or immune cells that you have in your body, causing them to release molecules called cytokines, which wake up a dormant immune system. And this treatment, even in the 1970s, turned out to be extremely effective. So this, these are patients uh, with metastatic kidney cancer. And as Dr. Diedrich was saying, this is a, uh, this is a Kaplan-Meier plot, basically a survival plot. So the higher the line, the better. And you can see here that there were 20 patients out of about 200 who had a complete response, what we call a CR. Uh, so they were effectively cured of their disease. So we say one in 10 patients who received this IL-2 therapy was effectively cured. And this is in the advanced setting, so patients with metastatic disease. So this is quite, uh, quite impressive. Here is a uh, CT scan of a patient uh, who was first diagnosed with metastatic kidney cancer to their uh, liver, as you can see by the shaded out region in the, in the liver there. And you can see even 20 years later, this is a scan of a patient who had IL-2 therapy back in the 70s, 20 years later, no evidence of recurrence in the liver. So quite impressive. The problem with IL-2 therapy is that it's extremely toxic. Uh, similar to kind of what we were talking about with the bacterial uh, uh, treatments that Dr. Coley was giving patients, these patients often land, uh, land you in the, IC, in the intensive care unit. So it's very difficult to give patients, and I would say in general we only give this maybe once or twice a year at Stanford, very, very rarely because it is so toxic. Um, but this started to give us reason for hope that the field of immunotherapy may be very promising. So in the, as you probably see now, this, the field of cancer immunotherapy is really a buzz. You've seen this in the, not only in the, sci in the scientific community, but also in the popular press. So you've seen this on the cover of Newsweek, it's on the cover of Time Magazine, and it was made actually very popular by uh, Jimmy Carter, who was diagnosed with metastatic, a metastatic melanoma, who had disease, uh, both had gone to his liver as well as to his brain. He got a uh, medication with a type of immunotherapy, and he has now uh, rendered disease-free 
uh, two or three years after starting treatment, which is quite remarkable. So there is a lot of promise uh, in, this, uh, in, in this type of therapy. Uh, so November 23rd, 2015 was a very important day in kidney cancer because this was the day that the FDA approved its first immunotherapy drug in kidney cancer. And as Dr. Diedrich explained, that was nivolumab or Opdivo. And some of you may have seen the commercials on TV uh, with the slogan of a chance to live longer. Uh, and that's somewhat debatable, but like uh, in general, it, it is a very good drug for kidney cancer and it is moving the field forward. So how does nivolumab actually work? So I'm gonna take you back to Immunology 101 and I'll start off with an example of when you get the cold or the flu. Uh, you don't take any medications, you don't even see your doctor most of the time. You take some chicken noodle soup and everything is better within one to two weeks, right? But why is that? So what's actually happening within your body? So your immune system is certainly at work. So your body has these T cells or these immune cells that are floating around your body that are essentially your first line of defense system. And you, all, you also have what's called these antigen presenting cells. And these antigen presenting cells are looking for foreign particles all throughout the body to bring them to the T cells to activate the T cells so that way it's programmed to kill whatever it's looking for. So your body does exactly that with the flu. So your, your body is able to recognize that you have, there are particles of the flu virus within your body and you have these dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells bring that particle of the flu to the T cells, activate them, and now you have a robust immune response fighting the flu. So then the next, next logical question is, why doesn't this work in cancer? Well, it turns out that cancer is extremely smart. So cancer has developed these escape mechanisms to evade the immune system. So what, do, what cancer does is that it holds up this white flag. And this white flag tells the immune system, hey, I'm one of you guys, don't eat me. And so what this white flag called scientifically on, on tumor cells is called PDL1. And so this is something that you may have heard of as well on the news as well. So PDL1 is this white flag that tells the tumor when it, when it engages with an immune cell, don't eat me. Um, and what, how nivolumab works then is the antibody that blocks this interaction between PDL1 and PD1, which is found on the immune cell, and thus effectively lowers that white flag. And when you lower the white flag, you reverse the don't eat me signal to an eat me signal. And then you allow the immune, the immune cell to gobble up that tumor cell, if that makes sense. Um, so this has been a very effective way of combating uh, kidney cancer and, and many other cancers in general. Uh, so that's how it works in theory, but then does this actually work in humans? Uh, so there have been uh, many clinical trials uh, looking at uh, this drug, and the registration trial which actually showed that the, there was benefit of nivolumab compared to other targeted therapies was this trial uh, called the Checkmate 25 trial uh, that randomized patients who had been previously treated with, uh, for, different, uh, for kidney cancer with different therapies like Sutent or Prozopinib. And these patients were then randomized to either get uh, nivolumab, which is the immunotherapy, or everolimus, or Afinitor as you, may, as you may know it. And you can see here on this overall survival plot that the patients in the blue arm, which is nivolumab, did significantly better than the patients who got the Afinitor, or the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or the uh, targeted therapy. And you can see here, the p-value, the p uh, it was, it's a good question, it was significant here, actually. Uh, the the uh, progression-free survival was not seen in the initial trial, uh, but the overall survival was significant. Um, I don't have the p-value here, uh, but it, it was significant, less than 0.05, though. Okay. Um, and if we look at the uh, response rates, uh, we do see that uh, the nivolumab group did have a higher response rate, meaning the patients who either got a complete response, which is very rare to see, only 1% of patients, or at least a partial response, which is more than 20% uh, reduction of their tumor. Um, and we can see that that happened in 25% of patients compared to only 5% of patients uh, with Everolimus. While that's great, we would love to see this number improve, however. So right now, only one in four patients are responding to uh, nivolumab, uh, nivolumab monotherapy, meaning if you only receive that one drug. Um, so what are the side effects of immunotherapy? So the side effects as noted in this clinical trial are that, well, for one, um, patients, uh, 20% uh, of patients had a, what we call a grade three or grade four side effect. So these are more severe side effects. So at least one side effect that was pretty severe. So that is somewhat toxic, is one in five patients. The most common side effects seen were fatigue, 
as well as rash, uh, pneumonitis or inflammation of the lung, which may manifest by a, with a cough, uh, and anemia or lowering of your red blood cell counts. Um, in general, we think of the itises when we think of uh, the immune-related side effects. Because as Dr. Diedrich was saying, most of the side effects are related to what we call autoimmunity. Because we're essentially taking the brakes off the immune system. So we're letting the immune system go rampant. And what can happen is that the immune system can start attacking itself. So these are all the different side effects that can happen uh, because of immunotherapy. So if you have your immune system attacking the colon, it's called colitis, and that can show as diarrhea. If you have, inf you have inflammation of the lung, we call that pneumonitis, uh, and that can present as coughing or shortness of breath. Uh, patients can also get rash, as we talked about, arthralgias, or uh, pain in the joints, uh, and quite a few other different side effects that you can see here on this chart. So then I want to talk a little bit about um, how, how long do you treat for? Um, so this has actually been a little bit controversial uh, because of this concept of what we call pseudoprogression. Uh, pseudoprogression as opposed to regular disease progression uh, is an immune-related phenomenon. So what we know in disease progression, in this regular old-fashioned disease progression, if we put you on a clinical trial and we get a CT scan eight weeks later, if things grow, we assume that's because the tumor itself has grown. So we typically take you off the clinical trial. However, what we've noticed in, in immunotherapy is that at the eight-week mark, sometimes thing, the tumors look bigger on the scans, but that's not necessarily because of actually tumor growth. It could be because of immune cell infiltration. So you have immune cells infiltrating the tumor so it looks bigger on the CT scan, but if you give it more time and allow the, uh, the immune system to do its job, you actually see that these tumors start to shrink over time. So this was data that was presented last year uh, that looked at patients who have actually previously progressed on the trial that we just discussed about, the Checkmate 25 trial of patients who got either uh, Everolimus or who, uh, patients who got nivolumab. And these patients were actually continued on treatment despite progression. And this is what we call a waterfall plot. So in 150 patients, they actually treated beyond progression. And here you can see each of these lines represents a new patient. If the bar goes up, that means their tumor got bigger. If the bar goes down, that means their tumor got smaller. And what you can see is um, patients who have already shown progression on a CT scan, if you get a CT scan at least eight weeks, if not later, uh, what you can see is that 30 or 20 percent of these patients uh, actually have a response of greater than 30 percent reduction in their tumors. So nowadays we say that if we can treat for longer, the better. So in general, we try to treat for six months if, as long as you're tolerating the side effects okay, because there's a, there's a chance that you could respond later even though your initial scan showed growth. So then the question becomes, where does the field go from here? How do we improve upon that 25% response rate? Well, so I'll go back to this slide and I'll say that, uh, remember when I talked about cancer waving that white flag? Um, well, it turns out that it's a lot more complicated than that. There are multiple white flags, unfortunately. So the thought is that if we use combinations of different mechanisms of how the tumors evade the immune system, potentially we can get a more robust response. So the field right now is going towards what we call combination trials. So if one is good, is two better? That's the big question that we're, we're answering right now. So Stanford was actually involved in a clinical trial uh, using two immunotherapy agents uh, called one, one is nivolumab and the other one is called uh, ipilimumab. Um, and these uh, drugs work by blocking two different immune pathways uh, that are essentially releasing the breaks off the immune system in two different mechanisms. So we know that the CTLA pathway and the PD-1 pathway are both uh, pathways that tumors use to evade the immune system. So we're actually now using drugs to affect both pathways. So this was done in the Checkmate 214 trial. So in this trial, patients, these are treatment naive patients, meaning that they've never seen any other type of treatment for their advanced kidney cancer. And they were stratified by risk. And Dr. Diedrich had previously talked about good risk versus poor risk. And essentially, this is the risk stratification is based on a series of both clinical parameters as well as laboratory parameters, looking at things like your hemoglobin, your calcium levels, your LDH, which is a marker of inflammation in the body. And then they also look to see how long you've been off, uh, you've had to, uh, and the, the time that it took you for you to, to, uh, to start treatment. Um, uh, as well as your performance status, meaning how robust you are and how well you're feeling at the time that you're starting treatment. 
So patients in this were in trial were actually randomized to two different arms. The first arm received combination immunotherapy with the two drugs that we talked about, nivolumab and ipilimumab. The uh, arm B received uh, sutent alone. And you can see here, and this is actually hot off the press, uh, this is actually not even published, this is a picture off of a Twitter slide that I saw. Um, so, it, and it shows that the overall response rate was quite impressive in the intermediate and poor risk patients. And that's important to know because this was not seen in the good risk patients. Uh, so the intermediate and poor risk patients, you can see that there was a overall response rate of 42% in the combination arm. Uh, versus 27% in the uh, targeted therapy alone arm. Uh, and you can see here that there was a 9% complete response rate. Almost 10% of patients were having complete responses uh, to the combination uh, immunotherapy treatments, which is quite impressive. And here is the preliminary overall survival curve, uh, which has also been shown to be statistically significant. And it shows that there is a significant improvement in overall survival with the two drugs as opposed to the one drug, um, and uh, importantly, the two immunotherapy drugs. So as Dr. Diedrich was saying, this trial was actually halted early because it was, it was shown that there was a significant improvement on one arm over the other, so they stopped the trial saying that everyone should potentially be getting this treatment. So this may be the new way going forward, uh, potentially, uh, in the next several years for this treatment of newly diagnosed metastatic kidney cancer. I will say that, the, uh, uh, that this, these drugs can be, that the toxicity was, uh, uh, was, was, was essentially combinatorial uh, in terms of uh, uh, the side effects that each of these drugs actually delivered. So that's one thing to consider. We don't have all the data. I, I, I didn't have all the data in front of me to be able to present to you some of the side effect profiles, but we know that uh, the addition of two drugs can be very, very toxic though as well. So something to watch out for when that data actually gets released. So I want to talk a little bit about immunotherapy trials here at Stanford. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of different ways that, are, that we can actually modulate the immune system. Uh, we can augment it either by inhibiting an inhibitor, meaning that some of these checkpoints that we talked about, the PDA, PD-1, CTLA-4, we can effectively take the brakes off their immune system to allow the immune system to be more effective. Or the converse is on the right side or the left side of your slide, uh, you can see that these are all activating receptors. So these actually boost the immune system. So we have a trial now that takes advantage of two of these combinations, the PD-1, so we're taking the breaks off the immune system and also using a antibody against CD27, which it works as an agonist and activating the immune system on the other side of it. So we have one that's gonna take off the breaks off the immune system and one that's gonna activate the immune system. And this is a trial of two drugs called with nivolumab with a drug called varlumumab, which is an anti-CD27 uh, molecule. And what we know is that in mice, this is actually very effective. These are survival plots in mice, and we can do a great job curing mice with a combination of these two different immunotherapies. Now the question is, what are we doing in, how are we doing in humans? And this is evolving, and we still don't have a whole lot of data yet because it is a phase one, phase two trial, so we're still very early uh, in the clinical trial. But they have published a little bit of evidence that shows that this may be effective. So this is a patient who had uh, metastatic uh, kidney cancer who has had prior lines of treatment, and you can see that even after one dose of varlumumab, you start to see a small regression of one of the patient's uh, lung nodules. So of course, you have to take this with a grain of salt because this is only one patient, um, but the data is starting to come out to see if this is going to be more effective. So and part of moving the field forward at, here at Stanford is that we try to get patients on clinical trials so we can see if these drugs uh, are indeed effective because the science is in general very promising. Um, we also have uh, clinical trials that are based on recent data that show that the adenosine pathway is a yet another way that tumors evade the immune system, uh, and this likely represents a mechanism of resistance for PD-1 therapy. So when, PD, so when drugs like nivolumab are no longer effective, the question is why aren't they effective? And it's probably because these tumors develop secondary mechanisms to evade the immune system, and one of these is the adenosine pathway. So adenosine is actually secreted by these small molecules on tumors called CD73, and when adenosine binds to an immune cell, the T cell, at the A2A receptor, it essentially renders the, the immune cell ineffective, okay? So it's very similar to that uh, checkpoint inhibitor that I talked about earlier. 
And what we know is that uh, we, we're now working with a company called Corvus Phar Pharmaceuticals, which has, which has built an, uh, a, a small molecule to block that receptor uh, that I talked about, the A2A receptor, essentially um, denying the ability for adenosine to, uh, to interact with the T cell uh, and therefore leaving it effective and uh, in, 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 uh, able to kill cancer. Uh, so the data still is very naive, and we're still getting the, uh, uh, more and more data. It's, it's still in the phase, phase one phase right now. Uh, but we know that in kidney cancer, uh, it looks relatively promising. So we see that in small numbers, and that's the caveat here, that 60% uh, of patients uh, re uh, responded when they were given this drug alone, and 100% of patients responded when they got the drug plus uh, a, another immunotherapy called atezolizumab, which is another PDL1 inhibitor. Um, but if you'll, you'll note there that there are only 10 patients there, so it's very, very early to say if there's really any signal or not. Um, Dr. Fan has actually uh, started a different, another trial looking at what we call a glutaminase inhibitor. Uh, so glutaminase inhibitors work by targeting the metabolic pathway uh, of these cancers. Uh, and this is actually an interest that many patients come to us with uh, because there's a lot of uh, these popular press uh, information out there about the way sugar affects uh, uh, cancer metabolism. Um, well, this is actually a glutaminase inhibitor which inhibits glutamine, which is a sugar metabolite, from getting into the cell. And essentially, this drug is starving the cancer cell and is being used in combination with immunotherapy to be a potential another promising target for kidney cancer. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to speak uh, about uh, kind of where the field is going in general. So those are some of the clinical trials that we have at Stanford. Uh, but in general, in the entire field of uh, uh, immuno-oncology right now, uh, a lot of the therapy is going towards combined trials, and not just necessarily two immunotherapy drugs, but a lot of combination trials looking at the use of immunotherapy plus other standard treatments, uh, such as the targeted therapy that we talked about. So if you'll see here, these are uh, all very large phase three trials that are undergoing right now, looking at, many of them are looking at immunotherapy, such as uh, avilumab or pembrolizumab in combination with, with, with with a targeted agent like Sutent or Excitinib. Uh, and I think in general, uh, we're, we feel that this may be the way going forward, is that they'll probably have some combination is which, is, is, is which treatment will eventually win out. Um, so just to conclude here, uh, you know, we've made enormous progress for advanced kidney cancer in the last decades. We have a number of new treatments that are now FDA approved. Uh, cancer and the immune system have a very close, uh, close relationship, as you have seen through the data. Immunotherapies such as checkpoint inhibitors are promising in a subset of patients. Uh, and the next steps include combination trials, vaccine studies, and biomarkers to predict who will respond to treatment, uh, which is something that Dr. Fan will be talking about here soon. Thank you all. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. question about something you talked about in the beginning about testing for a weak immune system. Mm -hmm. Two-part question, how do you test for it? And number two, is it a genetic kind of thing that children should, or adult children, or some should be tested if yeah, they if, find that, right. that we have one? It's a, a good, one? it's a good question. So the slide that I had showed, uh, showed earlier wasn't necessarily testing patients uh, randomly for a weakened immune system. We were actually inducing in a weakened immune system on them because they had a uh, kidney transplant. So what we do is we give them drugs like steroids, for instance, that weaken the immune system so that their body doesn't reject the, two, uh, the, uh, the donated organ. So we were actually giving them a weak immune system. In general, I would say that it's a good question about testing patients' immune system. The biomarker that we look right now to see if, uh, if drugs are, or if tumors are amenable to what we call immunotherapy is a, drug, is a, is a marker called PD-L1. Um, and I would say that right now it's, it's uh, prognostic, meaning that we could tell if it's going, you're going to do well or not uh, in general uh, with kidney cancer, but we, don't, we can't predict whether you're going to respond to treatment. Uh, that hasn't correlated to treatment uh, responses yet. Mm -hmm. Tell the difference whether it's a pseudo progression or it is a real progression. Yeah, it's a it's a terrific question. The question is, how do you know if this is truly pseudo progression or real progression? And I think right now there's technically there's two ways. Uh, one way is that you can technically, if you had a strong suspicion, biopsy 
uh, the tumor. And if you get back a bunch of inflammatory cells, that may be one of your, that, that may be one way to answer it. Oftentimes we do this clinically though. What we do is just we get another scan potentially four to eight weeks later to see if there's regression of that tumor. If the tumor continues to grow, we assume that it's real tumor growth. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So uh, the question is about CAR T therapy. So CAR T therapy is chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And what we do is actually is, is pretty interesting. Uh, so this therapy works by taking uh, your white blood cells and extracting them from your body through a process called leukophoresis. And then we take those cells and transfect them with a virus that is able to what we call upregulate a receptor or a, uh, a target that hones in on a certain uh, cancer target that you have an interest in. So for instance, in prostate cancer, it can be a PSA. In, in uh, lymphoma, it could be a target called CD19. Uh, the question is how to do this effectively in, uh, in kidney cancer. Um, and uh, in, in which receptor would you actually want on uh, to serve as a target for kidney cancer. So this has actually been looked at, and they, they have done preclinical models of CAR T cells looking at CA9, uh, CA9 which is a, uh, a target found on kidney cancer. Uh, but I have to say that they haven't seen any responses or haven't seen, it hasn't been as quite as effective yet in kidney cancer, even in the preclinical uh, pre uh, models. So it's still at the very early stages for solid tumors in general. Uh, it is FDA approved in, uh, now in leukemia, in a certain type of leukemia, and it looks very promising in certain types of lymphoma. Uh, and there was recent uh, data showing that it could be promising even in gli uh, glioblastoma multiforme, a type of brain cancer. But in general, I think the field of CAR T cell uh, for solid cancers is probably still a couple of years away, at least a, f a few years away. Okay, thank you so much, Sumit.